Hello, welcome to the EKG Guy if this is your first time. We're glad you could join us this week. So this week, we have a 59-year-old female with severe emphysema. And here is her presenting EKG. Okay, so take a look at it. Try to complete those things on the right side of the screen. Okay, those over here. Come up with a final interpretation, and I'll give you the previous EKG that we can compare it to. When you're ready, start the video, and we'll go through this together. All right, so here we have a 59-year-old female with severe emphysema, okay? The first thing we want to do is look at the regularity of the rhythm, okay? And from first impression, you probably notice that this is a regular rhythm, okay? And what do we mean by that? So let's look at regularity first. So when we look at that, we can use any interval here, but it's always good to be consistent. And that's why we'll often use these big R waves that are sitting here, okay? So these R to R waves are considered the R to R interval. And if you were to measure from one R wave to the next and one that followed, you would see that these are pretty much quite similar. And we would call this a regular rhythm. Okay, now it's important to know that because that helps us know how we can find the rate. And because it's a regular rhythm, there's a few ways we can do it. Okay, if it is irregular, then there tends to be only one. But, and again, the machine gives us the ventricular rate. Okay, but we want to know how to find the rate on our own because, as you can see, with any dropped complexes in a, you know, higher degree AV block, it doesn't give you the atrial rate. Okay, so it's good to know how to calculate this. So, Let's calculate the ventricular rate. We said there's two ways here because we have a ventricular rhythm. So we know that from beginning all the way to the end of our standard EKG is 10 seconds. So 10 seconds is the length or the duration of a standard 12 lead EKG. 10 seconds times six gives you 60 seconds, which you know equals one minute. And what does this mean? That means if you count and you want to find the ventricular rate okay you want to count the ventricular complexes whether it's the qrs complexes or t waves and then multiply that number by six to get an estimate of the rate in beats per minute okay so let's do that here let's count the qrs complexes one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so we have ten okay and ten times six is 60 beats per minute. So an average of the ventricular rate is 60 beats per minute. Okay, you could do the same thing with the T waves to find the ventricular rate because that re represents ventricular depolarization. So this in fact here is a T wave. Here's another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, not one there, it's not showing up. So as you can see, the rate is near 60 beats per minute. Okay, again, you would have 10 for that. The atrial rate, you would use the P waves, which are these ones. Okay, and again, you'd find here, each P wave has a, a QRS complex that's follow, and both the atrial and ventricular rate are the same. So 60 is a good average. The machine, okay, we can trust here, gave us 59 beats per minute. Okay, so just under the 60 beats per minute. All right, so that is the rate. Now there's one other way that I want you to be aware of, of finding the rate in these regular rhythms. So this way we just discussed here where you multiply it by six, okay, of a standard 12 lead uh, is for both regular and irregular rhythms, okay? So if you wanna learn one way that works for all, I would learn the way we just did it. Now there's another way for regular rhythms, okay? And those that are coming at a normal rate as we see here, and that's by finding one of those QRS complexes that falls on one of the thick lines or at least near to it, okay? So here's one here, okay? You can see that it's close to that thick line. And then you want to find the next R wave, which is this one here, and count the number of thick lines between them. One, two, three, four, five, okay? So just about five. And what you would do is 300 over whatever that number is. And we said it's five. Okay, five of those thick lines, and it gives you an estimate of 60 beats per minute. Again, kind of uh, affirming what we just found. Okay, so that's the other way to do it. You'll do 300 over um, how many of those big boxes are between it. If it was a faster rhythm, you could do 1500 over the number of small boxes. Okay, 
that's another way again these are only for regular rhythms okay so you wouldn't use it if you're trying to find the rate of atrial fibrillation you'd want to use that first way okay so now the rhythm origin where is this rhythm originating from well we see narrow qrs complexes okay so it's likely above the ventricle uh, we see p waves that we said are preceding each qrs complex okay so it's probably an atrial rhythm now we have to ask ourselves is it coming from the sinus node okay and remember the sinus node here's our box diagram that we use to simplify the heart here's our right atrium left atrium right ventricle and left ventricle okay sinus node sits up here behind the right atrium okay near the superior vena cava and then from there you have your internodal pathways the av node the his bundle the bundle branches and the uh, fascicles that then innervate the ventricular uh, Purkinje cells and then the cardiomyocytes okay so sinus node is up here okay so when we say sinus rhythm or sinal atrial rhythm is present that means the rhythm is starting from up here okay now what i want you to do is now take this here and superimpose the right atrium here okay so this is only the right atrium so i've only taken the right atrium and now let's put the sinus node up here and notice that conduction is heading in that direction okay so sinus rhythm heads in that direction that's what we call the normal p wave axis that sits between zero degrees in positive 70 degrees okay so if the normal p wave axis is in that direction that means all leads in that area should have upright p waves so lead one is here lead two is at positive 60 degrees avf is here okay in the horizontal plane you have v4 v5 v6 and then you have avr over here okay so as you can see all of these over here should have positive p waves whereas avr should have a negative p wave and if that's true, then we should uh, presume that sinus rhythm is present. And all the P waves should have the same morphology. And as you can see, all these have the same morphology. Okay, so that's one thing you want to see in sinus rhythm. And the other thing is that um, the upright P waves. Okay, we, so we said here's lead one. You can see the P waves. Here's lead two. You can see them. Okay, lead three is over here. So you don't always see them, but you do here. Here's lead AVF. You can see them as well. Uh, the horizontal plane v4 v5 and v6 also have them and then lead avr the inverted p waves okay so expect it in that lead avr as it's moving away okay the impulse is moving away from lead avr so you have negative p waves okay so in fact we do have a rhythm originating from the sinus node okay which we would consider sinus rhythm so we have a regular rhythm originating from the sinus node at a rate of 59 beats per minute okay in our adult 59 year old all right let's move on to the ventricular axis okay so ventricular axis because we just talked about the p wave axis there's always there's also a qrs axis or ventricular axis and we tend to be talking about the uh qrs complex that we take this into account okay now the st segment has an axis okay uh and so does the t wave but in this case we are just going to focus on our qrs complex all right so what do we need to know about this okay so you have to know first off that the normal ventricular axis lies between negative 30 okay negative 30 degrees and positive 110 degrees this is all normal ventricular axis okay so it heads towards the left ventricle this up here would be considered left axis deviation here's right axis deviation okay if it's beyond that area this is that northwest axis here's north here's west that's why we get northwest okay you make here superior rightward so meaning superior and rightward here's the rightward area of the heart okay so superior rightward axis no man's land many different uh ways that they uh, call this okay that's an uncommon area that we don't tend to see many rhythms in vtac obviously is uh, one of the hallmarks if it has that northwest axis okay so the normal axis or ventricular axis between negative uh, 30 and positive 110 degrees okay so negative 30 positive 110 so we have to know some leads okay we said lead one sits here the positive end at zero degrees then we have avf down here 
Okay, so let's use those leads first. So lead one is this one here, and lead AVF. So we're using the limb leads, okay? We're not finding the axis in the horizontal plane. We're finding it in the frontal plane. And the frontal leads are these limb leads here, okay? So lead one, as you can see, if you draw the isoelectric or the baseline, is actually almost equally positive and negative. Okay, let me just erase this. So you can see that. Notice it's equally positive and negative. So it's not going towards lead one or away from it, per se. Okay, in fact, it's kind of on this line. Okay, so let's take a look at the next lead. Let's look at lead AVF, which is down here. Notice that these QRS complexes are mostly positive, meaning that it's going to go towards lead AVF. Okay, so the axis going towards it, towards that positive 90 degrees. Okay, so because it's going towards it, the axis lies somewhere here. Okay, and you can see that lead 2 is here, lead 3 is here, and notice that lead 2 is positive and so is lead 3. Okay, so our axis is actually right around that positive 90 degrees. Okay, AVF, remember, sits at positive 90 degrees. So the axis here is actually what we call a normal axis. It's within normal limits, okay, but it's at positive 88 degrees. Okay, at positive 88 degrees, and in this adult female, okay, that is more of a axis that should alarm you. Okay, and why do I say that? Because usually as we age, we tend to get more of a leftward shift. Okay, as the left ventricle dominates, maybe we have uh, aortic stenosis or more demand of the left ventricle to work, and so it hypertrophies and gets bigger, and we see a leftward shift. Okay, so this rightward shift. And this older patient is something that you should be aware of. While normal, it's something that uh, we'll talk about shortly. Okay. Next, we want to talk about atrial conduction. Okay. And so here we want to look at the P waves. Remember, atrial conduction, we look at the P waves. Is there any enlargement of the atria? Okay. Right or left atrial enlargement. So in these cases, the best leads that I want you to look at are leads two and leads V1, okay? You can also look at the other inferior leads, but if you want two leads to look at, those are the best two. So actually, what's going on here is that there's evidence of right atrial enlargement. So let's go over the criteria for right atrial enlargement in lead two, as well as AVF and the inferior leads, okay? Lead two we'll look at here. So this is our P wave, okay? And I'll draw here what we need for the criteria. Imagine that is your P wave. The criteria is for this to be at least 2.5 millimeters in amplitude or 2.5 small boxes, okay? And you can clearly see that's going on here, okay? Maybe even so in those inferior leads, right? So just one lead helps to confirm it. In V1, okay, so lead V1, you have these biphasic P waves. The beginning represents right atrial depolarization the latter portion, the terminal portion, is left atrial depolarization. So any enlargement, we're looking here in the beginning. And what you want for that to be enlarged is that for this amplitude to be at least 1.5 millimeters, or 1.5 of the small boxes. Okay, hard to make it out here, and actually I don't think it really makes it there, but we do have evidence in the inferior leads. Okay, so Hopefully that makes sense. So 2.5 in the inferior leads, 1.5 millimeters in the um, uh, V1. Okay, and I want you to notice that what happens with right atrial enlargement, we see peaking of these, okay, or increase in amplitude of the um, P waves. Okay, whereas with left atrial enlargement, which is the latter portion de being depolarized, you get an increase in the depth and duration. Okay, so increase in the duration of this and we'll see sometimes these peaking okay where this has to be at least these peaks should be at least 40 milliseconds or one um small box in between and this should be greater than 110 milliseconds or at least three small boxes okay that's for left atrial enlargement okay and then over in v1 you look at this terminal portion, and this to this should be at least one millimeter by one millimeter, okay? 
Anyways, let's move on. So right atrial enlargement is present, and hopefully you saw that there. Okay, so the next thing we want to look at is AV conduction. Okay, and AV conduction, this is where we're focusing mostly on the PR interval. Okay, so is the PR interval prolonged or not? Are there any dropped beats? Okay, things like that to look at. Are we dealing with a, uh, you know, Mobitz type 1 or 2 or any other degree AV block? So in this case, AV conduction is actually normal, okay? You have a QRS complex that always comes after a P wave, and you have no drop beats. In fact, the PR interval, which in adults is normal between 120 and 200 milliseconds, was normal here. So normal PR interval, in this case, normal AV conduction, it was actually 146 milliseconds is what the machine gave you, and you can see that's within that normal limits there. Okay, next is IV conduction or intraventricular. Here we're looking at the QRS duration. Okay, so let's just, just so you're aware and everyone understands, the PR intervals from here to here. Okay, so it includes the P wave and it includes the PR segment. Okay, this is the PR interval. When we talk about the QRS interval or QRS duration, it's from the beginning of our QRS complex to the end of it. That's the QRS duration. Okay, this is your ST segment that follows, and this is your T wave. So the QRS interval, okay, well that looks at intraventricular conduction, should be less than 120 milliseconds, okay? Normal is between 70 and 110 milliseconds, okay? And in this case, it was actually normal. So normal intraventricular conduction, the QRS duration, or QRS interval, in this case was 90 milliseconds, which again is within that normal limit. Next, we want to look at waveforms. Is there any PR elevation or depression? Okay, of that PR segment, I don't see that. Okay, are there any um, ST segment elevation or depression? Okay, not so much here. Uh, are there any abnormal T waves? Okay, a little pointed here, but not so bad actually, and they are asymmetric, which is normal okay the patient did not have any evidence of uh hyperkalemia which you may see those pointed t waves especially in those uh anterior precordial leads early on so no waveform abnormalities there um in the qtc interval okay which is the corrected qt interval for time was actually 423 milliseconds okay and that's normal in this female. Remember, females, less than 460 milliseconds is normal, okay? Males tends to be less than 440 milliseconds, all right. All right, so is there anything else that we missed here? Anything else that you noticed? There's not so much anything uh, I see that stands out that's particularly uh, noteworthy. So nothing else that we noted. Okay, so let's look at our wave progression in the precordial leads. So these last two things have to do with the precordial leads, and that's V1 through V6, okay? So over in this range here. So V1 through V6, so just focus on this area here, okay? You have to know that these last two things are based on where the leads are placed on the chest. So these are the chest leads, and this is highly dependent on the person placing them on the chest which is an imperfect science. So let's look at R wave progression. Normal R wave progression, you should see the R wave, first positive deflection, these ones here, increasing as we go from V1 all the way up to V5. And you can see this R wave increases, okay? Maybe about the same here, okay? And then V4 and V5 increases, okay? But the other thing that you should notice is while this S wave is deeper, this one's actually smaller. So you can have an increase in the R wave from V1 to V5 is normal, or you can have an increase in the R wave to S wave ratio from V1 to V5, okay? Which we see here. So this is in fact normal R wave progression as we progress from the right-sided precordial leads to the left, okay? Towards that left ventricle. Okay, the dominant portion of the heart. All right, next let's look at the transitional zone. Again, we will focus our attention on these precordial leads. In the transitional zone here is where you're going from being mostly negative complexes to mostly positive as you progress from V1 all the way to V6. So this is mostly negative, 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 
and this becomes mostly positive. The normal transition zone is between V3 and V4. So notice we go from negative to positive between V3 and V4. So in fact, this is a normal transition. Okay, that's where you should tend to see that. So normal transition here. Okay, and that's all we'll state at this point. All right. So let's review what we discussed so far. So we have a regular rhythm at a rate, let's say at 59 beats per minute as the machine gives us, we can trust it in this case here, uh, sinus rhythm, okay, originating from the sinus node, a slight rightward shift, but within normal limits of the axis, right atrial enlargement we saw, normal um, AV conduction, IV conduction, and the waveforms were normal. We saw normal R wave progression and transitional zone in the precordial leads. So how would we sum this up? Well, we would say this is sinus, bradycardia. Okay, you could have said normal sinus rhythm based on that rate if you just used yours, which would be great. But we'll use the machine. So just below that 60 beats per minute, that's why we call it bradycardia. Okay, we said there's right atrial enlargement. Okay, and the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that this patient has emphysema, okay, a lung disease, severe emphysema, the FEV1 in this lady was very low, about 15%, so severe emphysema, and because of that uh, strain on the heart, you can have a shift rightward, okay, a rightward shift, and that's why her axis is probably at that positive 88 degrees, okay, so sinus bradycardia with a right atrial enlargement, okay? So compared to the previous, uh, what we have is an increased rightward shift of her axis, okay? Actually compared to two years ago. And we also see new right atrial enlargement, okay? So hopefully that makes sense, all right? So it's good to keep that clinical context, all right? And let's just, Try to understand why you would see that rightward shift, and then we'll end, okay? So imagine our heart here. Again, this is our right atrium, our right ventricle, our left atrium, our left ventricle, okay? Remember, blood comes to the right side of the heart through our inferior and superior vena cava, okay? So deoxygenated blood coming here, passing to through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, then it goes out to the lungs. So blood gets oxygenated in the lungs and then comes back to the left side of the heart, passes through the mitral valve, okay, and then goes out the aorta to the rest of the body, okay, and then from there, this whole system starts over again. So I want you to imagine if someone has a clot, a big saddle embolus, or a clot in their lungs, okay, or bad lung disease, you can see why there would be a backup of pressure, okay, an increase in strain on the right side of the heart to work more. So these patients may present with right ventricular enlargement. As that pressure backs up, you may expect then that the right atrium also enlarges, okay, and we saw that here with this patient. So very bad lung disease, maybe an acute saddle embolus, submassive um, or massive PE that puts strain on that heart can cause um, that strain pattern, okay? And these patients sometimes also present with bundle branches, right bundle branches particularly, okay? Because of that right ventricle being stretched causing that, all right? So that's just kind of an understanding of trying to put the clinical context of this patient with severe emphysema, very bad lung disease, uh, with the findings we see on the EKG. Well, that's the end of this week's EKG of the week. I hope you learned something. Now I wanna make you aware of our um, EKG coding reference that many of you are already using, uh, how to get access, okay? Uh, so you want to go to this link here. So put in that link into um, your, uh, into the computer, into your internet source, and then go to, put your email address here when you get to that. And then you're gonna use my password here to put in there. Make sure you're using my password every time, okay? And let me just erase here. So, so this one here, all lowercase, put that in and then click submit, confirm your email. So check your email, get a confirmation and you'll have access, okay? And access here 
will be this and you'll start to see that we have examples and I'm now adding videos into it so this is an on-the-go reference has everything you could possibly imagine uh, we use as we're building the course for our fellows here at Mail Clinic um, and so forth so I think it's quite handy our techs are using it we're using it for coding uh, here as well so very helpful way to learn to use as a reference and so forth okay and you'll see a lot of the things we discussed in this lecture uh, there as well all right, so a few things. If you thought, thought this was helpful, if you did, yes or no, I would like to know how I can improve, what kind of topics you want. Please leave them below. Like this video if you find this helpful uh, and share with friends. If you want more practice, okay, obviously more practice, practice is on our Facebook page where there's almost half a million of you there uh, and thank you for your support we have daily questions trying to get back to you uh, between our clinics and making sure we're staying in touch so uh, go there for practice there's daily practice I leave resources you can find us on Twitter search the EKG guy YouTube obviously uh, in Facebook okay it's hard to keep up with all these things so uh, find us there share with your friends if you find this helpful um, and please leave a comment if there's any topic um, or just kind words we always appreciate it and I hope you learned something today well thank you for making us the largest fastest growing EKG community in the world